Hi, welcome to Almost Cooperstown. I'm Mark. And this is Gordon, and we love talking about baseball. Hi, welcome to Off-Season Episode 8. Today we're going to talk about the Gold Glove and the history of the Gold Glove. There is a history of the Gold Glove because before 1957, there weren't any Gold Gloves. They didn't have any awards that were measured. Yeah, and I think it kind of just speaks to how over time, you know, defense has become something that's more and more valued, though, you know, I think it wasn't really until recently we started to kind of be able to quantify how valuable defense was. It was very perception based up until we started kind of developing like all these advanced metrics to check like run saved and stuff like how good a guy's defensive range is because you had a lot of guys that, yeah, they made every play on the balls they could get to, but they could get to so few balls. They weren't actually that good a fielder. Right. 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 You know, we, we talk a lot about the history of the game in, in this podcast and, and when the national league started in 1876, um, they did have a way with putouts and errors to sort of have some defensive statistics. Uh, and Henry Chadwick, the so-called father of baseball, uh, from, at least in some people's eyes, uh, came up with a box score. And But that's the way from that time it was done until the Gold Glove was awarded in 1957. It's pretty much fielding percentage. There was no range. There was no defensive run saved. None of the stuff that we use now. And I think it's like and and considering that, you know, you even look at current baseball and you see how teams have really started to value it so much more and having these guys on your team that, yeah, they might be a 230 hitter. But if they're playing, you know, gold glove caliber defense in center field, it's arguably worth it to have them out there every day because their defensive value is just so much higher than their offensive output. So, you know, you go into that history and you think about some of the guys that that played before 1957 that were thought of as good fielders. Um, and Saber, the Society for American Baseball Research, went back and tried to put sort of today's uh, metrics as best they could based on the statistics that they've got from the games that they went back through box scores and so on and so forth. And, you know, a guy named Joe Tinker in 1900s. He was Tinker's to Everest to Chance. We talked about the famous double play com- uh, combination. Um, so he came out really well out of that. Some guy named Art Fletcher in the 1910s. I've never heard of this guy. Uh, his metrics came out well. Frankie Frisch. But yeah, like Hall of Fame players and guys that were renowned for their defense, the advanced metrics panned out and showed that, yeah, they were really good defenders. It wasn't some just a perception thing with these guys. You just couldn't measure it, right? So, we just didn't have a way of measuring it. And yet when you get to the 60s, you know, the guy who showed up really high is Brooks Robinson. Well, okay, well, that makes sense. Brooks Robinson won a lot of gold gloves, and so, you know, I can see that happening. Um, one of his teammates, Mark Belanger, in the 70s was one of the best fielders we thought. Uh, we couldn't hit a lick. Um, and it turns out these advanced metrics support. So the advanced metrics do sort of begin to line up um, with the players as we get further and further along. So you probably can go back and look at those guys and go, I guess they were really good fielders because the metrics support them too. Exactly. And they, they did deserve all those gold gloves in recognition. So uh, Rawlings gets involved in 1957 in the gold glove. Uh, they only pick one team of nine players in that first year. Uh, and it's, of course, voted on by the sports writers. Um, Willie Mays, just for those that uh, was a gold glove winner and actually probably would have won another four or five gold gloves because he came up in 51 or 52. He just lost years where you could have right. won them because it just wasn't around to win. Yeah, exa- exactly. And and so in, in 58, they went to both leagues. So they awarded 18 gold gloves, one for each position. Uh, and that through 1964 um, was something that was voted on by the sports writers. And then, for whatever reason, they decided to change and turn it over to the managers uh, and the players um, where it has been since then, except that you can't vote for somebody on your own team. I think that's probably the best way of doing it, like, because certainly the writers can't watch. And like, the problem is, is that unless you're going to have a bunch of people sitting down and essentially mathematically giving out that award, it's ultimately always going to be perception based. But I just feel that like with the managers and the players, you're probably going to get who they actually, you know, is the best player. And it's not as narrative based as I think it might be if you had the writers doing it. I, I, you know, uh, Bill James factors big into all this because his research back in the seventies really began to give people a look at how people performed on a statistical basis in ways we hadn't looked at before. Uh, But I think even Bill James himself 
would say, but that's not the only measurement. It's not only, as you said, about statistics. Or there's there's certain aspects of of defense and positioning and forcing plays. I remember when Keith Hernandez uh, played for the Mets, and he would feel so shallow on bunts that he'd almost be in the in the batter's pocket when the guy was trying to lay a bunt down. And it's really nerve wracking if you remember that the first baseman is crawling in on you, and he's like right there, and and pretty gutsy on Hernandez's part because everybody said, why shouldn't the guy just take a a, a shot at at him trying to hit it past them. The point is, is that the defense was forcing the offense to make changes in what they did. That will never show up in any stat sheet. Well, yeah, it's not only until now when we're starting to see that with the shift being played so often, and now we're starting to be like, do we need to start quantifying statistics where, you know, we're keeping track of how well this particular guy is hit against the shift. Right, right, and 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 so now they, they the defensive alignments uh, favor the fielders making plays that they're more capable of playing based on the tendencies of the hitter, mm-hmm. um, and and I and it, these advanced metrics, which I think are great and really help us understand better, um, allow and, and we kind of were kidding around before this for guys to win Gold Gloves now who traditionally probably wouldn't have been thought of because they're not the stars of the game necessarily a lot of stars win a lot of gold gloves for a lot of years and you're also much less likely to get a guy who just wins year in and year out because it's his award to lose you know like you had to you had to basically play yourself out of winning a gold glove there was a stretch there and now it's like no you have to generally be the best fielder yeah i i you know uh, we talk about pete rose on the program I, i never thought of pete rose as a great defensive player and he played all over the place he played second base he played third base he played first base uh, for the championship Philly team in, in 1980. He also won two gloves, though, gold, gold, uh, gold gloves, I should say, in the outfield. So now, I'm telling you, Pete Rose was not the fastest guy. He didn't have a great arm or whatnot. He won two gold gloves on reputation, I would say. And I like Pete Rose as a player, but I just don't, I would never would have imagined that. I mean, Jeter won five gold gloves, and Yankee fans... They're going to kill you for this. I know. He wasn't <laughs> that. He was... There's so many oh man, there was a great there's a great onion article where they make fun of Derek Jeter where they're just like they're having like some one of his teammates talk and the teammate goes, Yeah, and I was just really impressed by Jeter's ability to uh take that routine ground ball in the second <laughs> inning and make it into an exciting play with that stupid jump throw. Well and, and, and you've talked about it, you know, Jeter has one of those, you know, of, the, of our six great plays, you know, Jeter made one of those plays. Yeah. So he's he's known for some of his great plays, but doesn't make you a gold glove fan. No, and, and Jeter is the kind of guy that I would almost make the remark that he he made plays look more difficult than they were sometimes, and <laughs> like like I think that helped him because he made a lot of flashy plays. But then there was also a lot of plays he just never made because he couldn't get to that ball. By the way, A Rod won two Gold Gloves at shortstop too. And did he win any at third? No, no. no interesting. No, no, I thought only- he was known as a pretty good. It, 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 certainly, third. when he was you know younger, a, a little bit more agile at shortstop, and until he moved over to third I mean, base, you even have guys like two guys like Alex Gordon, who just retired, won eight gold gloves in the outfield. I didn't even think he was that good a defender. Uh, we knew he was a good defender, but not that good, right? You think eight gold? All of a sudden, you start to think, well, if a guy's marginal and he's got eight gold gloves, you and I well, will sit here and say maybe we should think. Well, about one him. of his peers right now has eight gold gloves, and we'd say, yeah, this guy's on track to be in the Hall of Fame. That's Nolan Arenado, yeah, and 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 rightly so. By the way, I think Aaron Otto is or, is already on that track, and um, uh, Jim Edmonds. We talked about a number of times in center field. Won eight or nine Gold Gloves in center field. Uh, Andrew Jones won a bunch of Gold Gloves. Um, and are their Gold Glove compilations enough to push them over the top? Well, not to this no, point. I think I think the problem is unless you're a Brooks Robinson level defender, where it's kind of unquestionable how good you were. Gold gloves don't mean that much. You have to be so like an all time great defender. Hmm. Would you put Arenado now? Into Not that? yet. No, really? Not okay. yet. There, okay. Because because you would you say that Nolan Arenado is unquestionably better than Scott Rowland defensively? I'm glad you brought him up. Um, probably much better. Uh, I I wouldn't be able to quantify right, it. I don't, right. I don't, exactly. I, don't know. I wouldn't be able to quantify it. So it's not like with Brooks Robinson. You're like no. Brooks Robinson was one of the greatest third baseman defensively of all time. Like probably the only guy that close to him is maybe Schmidt. Uh, Nettles, I, I, Nettles, I talk about at that time in that league, and then it was, it was really bad to be the other guy we talked about before, right? And and so that also hurts. So unless you're in all, like, look at this. Keith Hernandez was a good hitter. Good to great hitter and probably the best defensive first baseman of all time. And even that isn't enough to get him into the hall, which we disagree with. Right. But if he can't get into the hall, gold gloves don't mean that much for getting you in the hall. 
That's just a fact. And you know, and, and we we in our steroid uh, episode number five, we talked about Barry Bonds and how ridiculous his one sixty two WAR is. Uh, but what's equally ridiculous are his eight gold gloves. And I don't know about you, but I don't know that steroids would help you catch the ball and throw the ball in the outfield. No, the people people say this. They say it about Barry Bonds. He had a Hall of Fame career before, before. he got onto the steroids. So you know, the, the, same with Clemens. Right. Like, uh, I saw a video the other day. They were showing that the replay from the 2000 World Series where he chucks the bat at Piazza. Clemens is so jacked in that video. Go back and watch that oh, yeah. if you have it. He does not look like a look – at, uh, look at that Clemens and look at the Clemens from like five years earlier. It Do you is remember reading people. his lips when he – because I remember this. Yeah. Like, what did he say? I thought it was the ball. I thought it was the ball. <laughs> and so like, like – He's got I, a bat in his hand. Like what he had a bat in his hand. And, and to like, <laughs> so you were throwing the ball at Piazza? Does that make this better? Um, by the way, whatever you say about Clemens uh, and from our standpoint, guys should be in the Hall of Fame. Oh, yeah, Hall of Fame. He was a Hall of Fame pitcher. So, um, and there were guys that, you know, won a lot of gold gloves. Uh, and one of the more interesting cases, I, I think, is Rafael Palmiero, who is also not in the Hall of Fame. Uh, and a lot of people remember him as being more of a DH than a mm-hmm. fielder. And he won three gold gloves at first base. And one year, he won the gold glove, and he only played first base 28 times to win the gold glove because there's no stipulation in the award for how much you have to play. Right, but if anything that just tells you right there, back then when they were giving that award away, it was a popularity contest and almost nothing more. And 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 that's why you saw, 100%, and that's why you saw all these guys, if you go through the history, it's like, like he won a gold glove, he won a gold glove, he won a gold glove. So it was his to lose. Yeah, and and now you look at, like, the like we were talking about this before the show, like, the current winners from this year's AL go gold ahead. gloves. Like, uh, Evan White from Seattle. I'd never heard of him. Right. Like, I'm like, like, I'm like, if you would, could you tell me Grant Canning, the pitcher? Come what, on. What team JP Crawford plays for? Yeah. Now, is it our fault? Because in some ways, a lot of these players are West Coast players. And so we're less familiar for them, especially because they're American League West Coast players. Yeah. But it's just interesting when historically so much of these would have been the historical carryovers. Andleton Simmons would have won one until he just basically stopped being a starter. <laughs> yeah, right. 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 And um, in 2020, it's kind of a weird season because I, I don't know. I, I never have seen a bunch of guys win a gold glove that I am not familiar with. And there were a number of guys that I, I mean, Joey Gallo knew. won a gold yeah, Joey glove. Joey Gallo. That just b- blows my mind. And, and yet that what they're doing is, is they're using advanced metrics to help them pick the gold glove now in a way they didn't before. So I have more belief that Joey Gallo is probably more probably deserving. Earned it. Yeah, right. he, he right. earned that Even that though I always glove. thought he was kind of a hack out there in the outfield. Well, I was wrong. So, um, you know, there are a lot of guys who've won multiple you know, gold gloves who aren't in the Hall of Fame. Um, and and as at pitcher, one of my favorite guys to talk about, and he is one of the seven players. Actually, it's not seven. It's eight. Uh, that have won gold gloves in both leagues. Mm-hmm. Mookie Betts just uh, performed that just feat this that, year, yeah. correct? Uh, and Jim Cott, who won 16 gold gloves, 14 in the American League, two in the National League, 250 career wins, not in the Hall of Fame. Think he should be, but but here's here's the question I have for you. Do the 16 gold gloves, which is up there with the most of all time, does that does, should that have put him over the top? Would that be enough with 250 career wins? And I think his ERA was not fantastic, and his whip wasn't fantastic, but it was good, and he pitched for a zillion years. No. No. Because being the best fielding pitcher of all time, it's not that big a distinction. Out of all the positions on the field, would you say? Yeah. I'd it's the least you. meaningful. I would, I would agree with you. Greg Maddox was a great fielding pitcher. He is not in the Hall of Fame having anything to do with, with how he fielded the baseball. Exactly. So um, uh, anyway, um, the other guys that won a couple of uh, gold glo- won gold gloves in both leagues are guys like uh, Shane Victorino, who we yeah, talked about, which is just wild that you like, he won two gold gloves and, and and one in each league is 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 weird, yeah. Right. But you know what? He was a guy that was a like cross league transplant, kind of at the height of his stardom, right? That brief window where he was a great player in the majors, like. He got, he went to the Red Sox, I think, and yeah. won it there. And yeah. so, like, it makes sense that like, and he, got, he was a very good baseball player, but a true almost guy. 
Oh yeah, right, right. As as are a lot of these guys who won it and just winning. So winning in both leagues is kind of tough, right? Because you have to unseat probably somebody, or maybe somebody got traded out of the league to come into the other league and win it. And guys like J T. Snow, who played first base in in, in the eighties, very good ball player. In Didn't the know 80s. he had won. I thought he was six, like a nineties to two thousand. Yeah, 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 yeah. In the nineties, um, uh, uh, Viscal. Won them in both leagues. And and, and Vizquel is the kind of guy that you think might have gotten it on Legacy, yeah, especially yeah. when he got the ones in the National League. I, I was, I was going to say that, too, that he was, you know, kind of a guy who just kind of hung around for a long time and, and got Tommy Agee of the Mets and Robin Ventura of the Mets. And they both played for the White Sox before they came to the Mets. Weird that you would have had guys win them the same. They won them both for the Mets and the White Sox. Correct. So they came weird. from the same team. And well, obviously... 30 years apart. But, but still weird that that, yeah, that, yeah. that that it worked out that way. But it's just not that easy to win them in, in both leagues. No, because there's only a handful of guys that are even in consideration each year. Because it's the kind of thing where you can't have a singular – like with the MVP award, you play well enough in a single year, you can win the MVP. It's hard to play well enough out of nowhere to win a gold glove because it's a very reputation-based award. And Dave Winfield was another guy who won them in, in both leagues. Mm-hmm. So a guy we talked about as a, a guy – we think should be in the Hall of Fame. A great fielder for the Red Sox, Dwight Evans. He won eight gold gloves. We've talked about this before. Yeah. He had also uh, 400 career home runs. He, right, right, he did right. a lot where, of where, other things. Where, where you can now point to the fact of this guy was a complete player. But I think it gets really hard if you weren't a good offensive player to use the gold gloves as the defense, as the metric, because it's just less meaningful than being a powerful offensive player. You, okay. So you're right. You're right. So let me let me read it to you. The guy's career: seventeen seasons, fifty point seven WAR. So there he is, right about the three per season we like to see at least to have a conversation. Three hundred fifty three home runs, mm-hmm. two seventy seven career batting average, three thirty one on base average. That's all right. Uh, won nine Gold Gloves in a row in center field. Who is it? You know, hmm. he is not in the Hall of Fame. Give me a team: Minnesota, Tory Hunter. Correct. Um, and he played for the Angels too. I think he has some. Yeah, and he played for the, the Giants. He was. Yeah, I think so. I or, think, but mostly or, or with, or with, with the Twins and the mostly Angels. Mostly the Twins and the Angels. So, so you know, you would think at, for, at center field, right? Very difficult position, right? But he was in. A, I don't think his peak was good enough for long enough. So here's the comparison I'll give you. This is a good one. Okay, so Andrew Jones. We talk about Andrew Jones with the 400 plus career home runs, mm-hmm. uh, a little more than Tory Hunter, but certainly not the average hitter that Tory Hunter was. Uh, thought of Andrew Jones as probably the best defensive center fielder in the game or by one many of, people yeah, in history. Yeah. But but Tory Hunter with nine Gold Gloves was right there. Played kind of contemporary. Yeah. with Andrew Jones, and so to a degree. Got even though he played in the other league, got pushed down a little bit in, in overall reputation. And I don't think Tory Hunt. I don't. Do you think Tory Hunter has a sniff? No. At the Hall of Fame? Do you think jo- Andrew Jones has a sniff? He hasn't. He's got, got a yet. better one. So he's going to have to be picked by the Veterans Committee, probably. Right. I think if Andrew Jones can't get in, Tory Hunter's not getting in. So and and to support your contention on pitcher Gold Gloves not meaning that much, uh, the Yankees had a pitcher named Ron Guidry. Uh, Gator, mm-hmm. really, really good pitcher, great career. You know, had a short career. That probably is, is harmful to him. He didn't get his first glove until his eighth season, hmm. and then he won five gold gloves. In it's a pretty row. good, but I mean, again, if Not you're enough. just again, if you're especially if you're just an average pitcher. Well, he wasn't an average pitcher. He just didn't do it for twenty years. He did it for eleven or twelve or something like that. Just wasn't long enough. So yet the the winning percentage for good Yankee teams, strikeouts, all stars. Gidry was a really, really top notch pitcher. I, I don't doubt it. He just wasn't a Hall of Fame pitcher. No, no, and, and the gold gloves I'm saying does not they don't they're not him. a needle mover. Right. They're really not a needle mover. It's like it's the same way that if you're a guy that compiled a lot of statistics and you look at your career, you're just like you just you put up 20 home runs in a bunch of different seasons. <laughs> that's a compiler. That's a compiler. You grab a bunch of gold gloves. It's just one part of your, your – the only thing that you can say now is that now generally you'll know if a guy has won a bunch of gold gloves in the modern era, like like modern, modern era, like Arenado. You know, okay, this guy is a 
plus offensive player and a plus plus defensive player. And we're we're evaluating his range now and things about his ability that we didn't used to evaluate. The, his defensive zone. And right. that, like I think that's what the the key statistic is is basically what is the radius around him that he reasonably gets the balls and then what is his fielding percentage on those balls. And so if you have a guy that has a really big zone and are, like like Arenado and he's able to make all those plays, he helps you save so many runs over the course of the season. To relate it back to the Mets, this is kind of why you look at a team like the Mets where you'd say they should be a really good pitching team. They should have a really low team ERA, but they don't because newsflash, their defense up the middle of the last years has been bad. Right. Like right. Nimmo is not a great defense, like not a great defensive center fielder is probably kind, a kind <laughs> thing, way to refer to him. Rosario was passable at short. Uh, that might be generous too, but he was at least okay. Cano was a guy that played second base. Like, like, yeah, he, he still was Cano when the ball, as long as the balls hit at him (laughs) at him. And he was good. Pete, Pete wasn't that good a first baseman. Yeah. Uh, and then there's J.D. Davis. Then there's J.D. Davis the third. That, so that's how you team take a team of star pitchers and turn them into a, a team of four ERA pitchers because all of the balls that should be fielded, the hits that get through that – like it's the kind of thing where you get a ground ball through between first and second – and it looks like a clean hit, but if you've got a second baseman that's got the range and the first baseman that are playing in the right spots, they feel that ball cleanly put out. Yep, every time. Every time. Every time. So um, we talked about the year of the pitcher, 1968, when ERAs were really low and guys, you know, they had to uh, lower the mound because the guys couldn't hit. But in 1969, the Orioles, who who played the Mets in the World Series that year and, and lost and won the next year, 1970, with this basically the same team, had four gold glove winners. On one team. They were not a very good hitting team. I will say they probably didn't have to be because they had uh, Davey Johnson and Mark Belanger, Brooks Robinson, and Paul Blair playing defense for them. That's a pretty good foursome that, you know, and up the middle in particular. You got Belanger up the middle. You got Blair in center field. You look at it, and, and it's like another team that tried that, and it took them to the World Series was the Mets. You had that Ventura Ordonez uh, Alfonso Olerud infield that was, you know, the, rated as the best defensive infield of right, all time. Because back by then, some right, right, right. Because back then, our way of rating the best defensive infield was who made the least errors in a right, season. Right, right, right. No, nothing about range, range, or actually ability to get to the balls. If anything, if you're measuring it purely by only errors, it actually encourages guys not to go for balls. Because it's better. Like, think about it. If you're marked only on the errors you make, you making an effort. Oops, that one got through. Oops, that I just couldn't get to it in time. That's just a hit. Sorry, that's not an error. <laughs> Let the other guy get it. Let the outfielder pick it up. Yeah. So, um, the most Gold Gloves ever won by one player uh, is by Greg Maddox. He won 18, 13 in a row. So again, still basically on reputation. I'm sure he was. Very good in the 13th year after he won it that first year, but it's hard to believe he would be as good in year 13 as he was in year one. Exactly. And that's where I think most people kind of feel that the, probably by then defensively there was a younger pitcher that had more range that made more impactful plays than Greg Maddox. And we talk about Irod because we both love that player and think he was you know one of the greatest of all time, as you said in, a, in, in our recent podcast. He's got the most gold goals for a catcher at 13. That's amazing because to think that a catcher after 13 years of wear and tear would be as good defensively as he was in the first year. And you know, year. he probably wasn't. <laughs> he probably was, actually. Well, yeah, Irod might have been able to because Pudge, Pudge was that good. But I think it's also the thing is catcher was probably the one kind of different position because they did have other metrics they could track for mm-hmm, them defensively. Mm-hmm. Your ability to throw guys out was such a valued thing and Pudge was so much better at it than everybody else that it makes sense that he kind of stood out as the best defensive catcher because of his ability to throw people out where you really – because it's like a guy's ability to get a bunch of putouts and outfield assists. I don't know how much that's on – like that's as much on the team putting him in a position where he can get outfield assists as anything else. Right. I guess on a fly ball when you're throwing a guy out, that's one thing. But if you run to the corner to pick up a ball you might have caught and you throw out and you get a guy, you get an assist on a play you might have made. There's no statistical, you know, or, or yeah, that. Exactly. Or you have a bad third baseman. So you're getting balls hit up the line all the time where you get plays to throw them out. And if you have a great third baseman, none of those balls get through. So I, I think I, I have more confidence today that the gold glove is representing uh, the true defensive prowess of a player as 
compared to even 30 years ago before the advanced metrics, fielding Bible, things of this nature came into right. play. Right. I think we both agree on that, that right now, realistically, if you're saying who's ever winning the gold glove in each league is probably the best defender in that league at that position. But when guys go to do contracts with their team, certainly there's going to be a bonus in, in their contract a lot of times, right? If they're an incentive lease contract for a gold glove. Win the gold glove, we'll give you an extra 50000 or 100000 or whatever. So it still matters to the team because it is a measure at least. And now we've got a better way of measuring instead of saying, yeah, the managers go, oh, Ozzie Smith, we're going to give him another glove. Got Ozzie's a great shortstop. I don't know. He looked pretty good this year. Yeah, he didn't, didn't, did <laughs> Ozzie lose? Didn't make a lot of errors. Didn't look like he lost a step. He's still the best. Right, right. And he won 13 gold gloves, you know, uh, because of that so uh you know it goes it just goes back that as you said before fielding skill has really come around to be valued much more highly because defensive metrics are more understood and and a team playing well uh playing good tight defense like the rays did last year Uh, even the dodgers played good defense it's really hard to get there if you're just a bludgeoning team uh, like the 1995 cleveland indians that's a good example of a team that wasn't a great fielding team uh that could just hit the heck out of the ball because you're eventually going to have a game that you're not hitting Right. Defense will always be there. It's the same principle with football and basketball. Defense is mostly effort based in terms of like more so in other sports than in baseball, where a lot of it is reaction and and that. But it's still very effort based and interest based. And so you're going to have defense. Defense is independent of how good the other team's pitcher is that day. <laughs> and, and right. And how hard the contact is. You know, and all that. The pitchers, you know, getting to swing to contact, but they're hitting weak ground balls and all that. That's a that's a, a good ga- good game for your fielders. Exactly. So so it's it's like you can bring defense every single game. So you'll be a very consistent team if you do that. And consistent teams can make deep runs. So there was a player, and this is to your point, right? Uh, in the uh, in the nineteen eighties, Frank White played for the Royals team. They won the championship in eighty five. Uh, second baseman, really good ball player, had eight Gold Gloves. He also had a two fifty three career average and a two ninety three career on base average. So, yeah. Frank White doesn't even get into the conversation, even though he has the most gold gloves are up there for all time at second base. Right, yeah, but he wasn't a Hall of Fame player, but he's a player that's still valuable to a team. Right, right. That Royal team wouldn't have been as good without Frank White. They weren't counting on him to hit 320. That was what for no, George and Brett now, to do. And now I think, whereas I think in the early 2000s, you know, from tw- you know 2000 to 2010, you only wanted guys that probably could hit for some power, like you didn't care as much about the defense. Now I think you're okay with a guy that hits 230 in your lineup if he's going to play gold glove caliber defense in a position, especially a premium defensive position. Boy, I don't think I agree with you. I think that's the difference. That's a big difference today. You can't yeah. be Mark Belanger anymore. Uh, Kevin Pillar. <sighs> Did Pillar even win gold gloves? Uh, I mean, he he's been, to- but he's been starting. He gets he starts every right. season. You right. have the Kevin. You won't Clear- be starting this year. Kevin Clearmeyer starts every yeah. season. Yeah. Good de- Andrelton Simmons starts but every. Listen season. to the positions you're talking about: center field, premium defensive short positions. Okay, yeah, right, right. that's what I'm saying. You will. You will. Talk- I don't know if I put second base in that in in that category. I think it depends on the rest of your team. Mm. I think you're right. I think you're right. I think it, it, you can't, can afford, it can't matter. What I'm saying is you but can catch your shortstop center would be the first three that I would Yeah, where you're like, line. I'm okay if this is going to be my weakest hitter in my lineup for defense because you need it. Right. And, and you know, we, we've got a guy who just re-signed with the Cardinals. I think he's, I don't know how many seasons Yadier has played. But here's a guy whose defense is still very good, who's certainly in the last, you know, year or two of his career, one would think, um, who's got a pretty good shot at the Hall of Fame as much because he brings both facets, you know, to the side. He, yep. he, he's won gold gloves. I don't know that he would be thought of as the best catcher, you know, ever, but really, really good catcher. But he had an offensive game to go with it, and that's what's going to bring him into the Hall of Fame. His offense as a catcher, being the, yeah, being just the thing is, is you can you can't really put up overwhelming defensive numbers. It's a lot harder to do that than it is to put up overwhelming offensive numbers where you can just say it doesn't matter what he was defensively. He was so good offensively he at the catcher to be position. In at any position. Manny Ramirez was not a good defensive outfielder, but he was so good offensively that it doesn't matter he should be in the Hall of Fame. It's a game about hitting still. It's a lot harder for you to do that on defense. So, uh, you know, we saw what happened, like I said, about some of the guys that won the gold glove this year. Um, Do you think uh, that 
the uh, fans will ever graduate beyond looking at gold gloves and start looking at fielding Bible awards or the gold glove has been there long enough that it's going to be the standard and it's going to have to keep doing what it's been doing, incorporate these advanced stats from other platforms. It's going to have to incorporate the advanced stats. Fans aren't interested in going that deep into the advanced statistics. I think you're you're right. Um, And I guess my last question, Mm -hmm. um, so the Mets – the Mets. Any Gold Glove winners on the Mets possible for this season? No. Nope. Maybe Lindor. May, Lindor. Maybe Lindor, and maybe Almora if he actually started yeah, for an entire all. season. He, and I don't think he's, well, he's got to play twenty eight games. I guess he'd be good enough. Not, I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah twenty eight is <laughs> not going to be enough. No, I don't think so. Yeah. Lindor would be the only guy. And 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 it's just interesting to me that that. There are more unheralded guys now that get recognized for their defense, so it doesn't have to be coupled. Just because you're a good offensive player, they're not going to give you sort of a uh, a boost in your defensive rating. Now, if you don't rate out defensively, you're not going to get voted. You don't, the yeah, award. you don't. Name recognition is not enough to win alone anymore. Right, right. So, um, okay. Well, I, I think um, gold gloves are something that you know we're going to still look at as the kind of thing. You know how we talk about uh, playoffs can't uh, hurt a guy's. Uh, prospects to get into the Hall of Fame. Yeah. But they can help it. Yeah. Okay, the same thing with gold gloves. If you get yeah. them and you're marginal... But yeah, yeah that's what we already said. But you, the thing is, you already have to be at a point where you were probably good enough to be in the Hall of Fame on the strength of your offensive statistics well, alone. Well, look, he won seven gold gloves, too. Yeah, he was a complete player. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening. Subscribe to our podcast on your favorite platform. And you can follow us on Twitter at AlmostCoop.